everlasting Abba, gracious Yahuwah Elohim. Your voice has summoned us together once again as we observe the Moedim today, the feast of first fruits, manifesting your love and the power of your resurrection. Thank you so much, loving Father. We belong to you in fellowship. We belong to you in promise. And soon we shall see you face to face in the kingdom that you are preparing for your people. Father, thank you so much. Because by faith, we are able to approach you. And by your gracious love, you receive us unto yourself. May you please take the opportunity now to enter into our hearts. Be our source of comfort and joy. Indeed, the world is full of sadness and sorrow. Many people go through deep grief in their life. But when we approach you in prayer, when we assemble together like this in worship, we feel your presence that uplifts our souls and gives us the strength to go on. And so we thank you, Abba. Thank you so much for the blessing you have given to all of us. Our King Yahushua, we remember you, how you fulfilled the Father's Moedim. You gave up your life. You were buried. But we also believe that you have risen from the grave and you are in the right hand of Abba now. Thank you so much for the work of your redemption, the work of your restoration. We believe at this moment you are in our midst. May you please continue to strengthen our hearts. How we long to hear from you. Manifest yourself, loving King, and strengthen our love once again. Father, please forgive our sins. We implore you to please remove the iniquities in our hearts that there will be no barrier in us feeling your mighty presence. Father, please bless your people throughout the world. Accept and bless the offerings we present to you that you may be glorified. We ask and beg everything, loving Abba, in the name of our Lord and Savior, Yahushua HaMashiach. Amen. Praises be to our loving Father that we are able to gather once again uh, today as we observe the Feast of First Fruits. It is one of the Moedim that is during the time of the spring feast or spring festivals. We are truly happy that we are able to meet together once again, although we are not in person in this sacred gathering. We believe we are bonded together by one spirit and by one love. And of course, we firmly believe that our King Yahusha is in our midst as our Father from up above continue, continues to shower upon us his mercy and his love. We all know that the spring Moedims, it includes not just the Passover, not just the Feast of Unleavened Bread, but also the Feast of First Fruits. 
when we celebrated Passover, we commemorated the death and suffering of our King Yahushua, and then we celebrated or observed the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is actually a seven-day celebration. We do not eat leavened products. It is to remember that the ongoing work of Yahushua removing the influence of sin in our life is a process, and so we strive and do our best to do the work of sanctification as we continue to mature and grow in the spirit. Contained within the seven-day festival of the Feast of Unleavened Bread is what is called the Feast of First Fruits. So when is the Feast of First Fruits celebrated, and what is its purpose? Let's begin our studies in the book of Leviticus 23, 9 to 11. And Yahuwah spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Yasharal and say to them, When you come into the land which I give to you and reap its harvest, then you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest. He shall weigh the sheaf before Yahuwah to be accepted on your behalf on the day after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. And so what is the feast of first fruit all about? When was it observed? When Yahuwah gave the instruction to Moses and to the people of ancient Yasharal. Bible says the feast of first fruits is to be observed. And on that day, which takes place the day after the Sabbath, which would mean it would fall on a Sunday. And so on that day, what is the priest going to do? He's going to wave a sheaf of the first fruit of the harvest. Now, what is the sheaf of first fruits all about? Bible says, when you come into the land. And so this was first observed when they first entered the land of promise or the promised land. And so when they enter the land of promise and they're able to have a harvest before they eat of the harvest, they are to first offer a first fruit offering to Yahuwah. And this is why what the people were instructed to do was to gather the first fruit, which is the first and the best that the land has to offer. They give that to the priest and the priest will wave it on the day of first fruits. And so what was required from the people of Yashara? In the next slide, we get a summary of what was to be expected. And so each Israelite who possessed a harvest, they observed the feast by bringing a single sheaf from the first fruits of the barley harvest to the priest, who would then wave it before Yahuwah. This wave offering was prescribed by Elohim as a symbol that Elohim would ensure that the remainder of the harvest would be realized in the days that follow. We have to keep in mind that during the days of ancient Yasharal, when they dwelled on the land, the main source of economy was, of course, agriculture. And so the people depended on the produce of the land. And so when they harvest, they need to make sure that they are properly able to do this to produce what they need in their life. Of course, if there was no produce of the land, they have nothing to eat, they would suffer poverty, perhaps they will suffer and perish. So they're very dependent on the land. But Yahuwah wants the people not to be dependent on the land, but upon who? Yahuwah, because it's so easy as a human being to depend on the gift of Yahuwah instead of the giver of the gift, who is Yahuwah himself. And so there is this instruction that Yahuwah gave connected with the Feast of First Fruits, which is when it's time to harvest, before you do anything with your harvest, present the best, present the first to Yahuwah by giving it to who? The priest. And then the priest would wave it before Yahuwah. Now, during the spring feasts, next slide, please. What was harvested was barley. This is why we call it the feast, the Abib, the month of Aviv, which represents or is connected with the barley harvest, not the wheat harvest. The wheat harvest doesn't come until about the Pentecost. And so during the spring feast, it was all about the barley harvest. And so the Israelites who harvested the land, they were to get the first fruits, which represents what again? The first and the best 
that the land has to offer. And they were to take one sheaf of it, next slide, and give it to the priest. The priest will wave it as an offering to Yahuwah Abba. And so what principle is expressed when the people of Yasharah presented what was best to the priest to be offered up to Yahuwah Abba? Let's read the book of Proverbs, chapter 3, 9 to 10. Honor Yahuwah with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase. So your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. What principle was observed in connection with the celebration of the feast of first fruits? It was the principle of honoring Yahuwah with our possessions. You see, Yahuwah wants the people of Yasharal not to depend on the land, not to depend on anything else but our Father Yahuwah. This is why when they were to enter the land of promise, they were to express their thanksgiving, they were to express their trust, they were to express the fact that they truly honor Yahuwah, that all things come from him. And so they were to give the first fruits of all their increase. And so the Feast of First Fruits, first and foremost, it was really a day of celebration and a day of thanksgiving to our Father Yahuwah. And so what we have is the Passover, the unleavened bread, and the Feast of First Fruits. Passover, death strikes Egypt, but passes over Yasharah. And so the instruction was to kill a Passover lamb and to smear the lamb, the lamb's blood across the lintel and on the door frames of the houses. And so when the tenth plague, which spread across Egypt, when it struck the firstborns, the death passed over Yasharah, but it did not pass over the Egyptian households. And so this led Pharaoh to say to Moses, okay, go ahead, let your people go. And so the people of Yasharah, they were let go because death that struck, that struck Egypt passed over Yasharah. Unleavened bread it represented Yasharah fleeing Egypt. And so they celebrate the Feast of Unleavened Bread to celebrate, to commemorate how they were able to escape the armies of Egypt in the Feast of First Fruits. It was to commemorate the day when they entered the land of promise. And so they expressed their thanksgiving to Abba and they honored him with the first fruits of what the land had to offer. And so that's the Moedim for the spring festival, the Passover, the unleavened bread, and the first fruits. However, as you already know, when it comes to the Moedim, it is called Moedim for a reason. The word Moedim means appointed time. And so Yahuwah has an appointed time or a schedule that he follows concerning the unfolding of his plan and purpose, which is the work of redemption. And so we know our King Yahushua fulfilled this plan. Our King Yahushua fulfilled the Moedim. How so? In our previous studies, we know the Passover. On the 14th day of Aviv, our King Yahushua died on the cross. On the day of unleavened bread, our King Yahushua was buried inside the tomb. However, what happened on first fruits? Why are we celebrating first fruits in connection with Yahushua and how he fulfilled Moedim? Well, let's go ahead and find out the answer. We know where King Yahushua died. He was buried in a tomb that was purchased by Joseph of Arimathea, a wealthy Jew. And so he was buried there when he was there. What happened on the day of first fruits? Let's read the book of John 20, 1 to 2. Now on the first day of the week, which would be the day of first fruits, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early while it was still dark, and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. And so the day is Sunday, and Mary Magdalene decides to go to the tomb. If you still remember, Mary Magdalene was one of the women who, before Yahushua was taken to the tomb, or while he was in the tomb, prepared the body by anointing it with spices and certain oils and fragrances. 
And so Mary was concerned that perhaps maybe she did not do a good job because she was in haste because they had to do this before the, uh, the Sabbath came. And so he, he wanted to go back to the tomb. And when he went back to the tomb, what did she notice? She noticed the stone had been taken away from the tomb. And so this is interesting. And so unlike other tombs, there is this big stone that is blocking the tomb. And according to some artist's rendition, this is how it may have looked like. You see that big slab of stone? It was hosted there by the Romans because there was this rumor that was being spread rapidly that Yahushua would rise on the third day. And so the Roman soldiers, the Roman uh, emperor, the Roman people, they, they kind of caught wind concerning this. And so they wanted to make sure that no one would be able to take away the body of Yahushua. Because if they were to do that, they can easily claim Yahushua had risen. And so what did they do? They put a big slab of stone to cover the tomb, and they also assigned guards to guard the tomb. So this is what it may have looked like. You notice they also fastened uh, something to secure the stone. You can see these spikes. It turns out today, if you go to Yerushalayim, in the place that is called the place of skull or Golgotha, in the garden tomb, there is this place that looks like this today. Next slide. Perhaps next year, when we have our trip to Yahshara, Yahuwah willing, we would be able to see this site, which is believed by many to be the actual burial site of our king, Yahusha. You notice there's a remnant of the iron spike that was there. We can take a closer look at how it looks like. And so this is likely the place where our King Yahusha was buried. And so we had one of our sisters who were, was able to go to that place. And she said that she wept when she entered and when she looked at the empty tomb. And so when Mary went to the tomb, what did she find? This is what she found, basically. There was no stone and there were no Roman guards. And so when she saw there was no stone, what did she do? And so verse two, it says, then she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Yahushua loved and said to them, we have taken away the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. So apparently Mary noticed that the tomb was empty. But what was she thinking? That someone took the body of our king, Yahushua. But of course, the question that needs to be asked is, what happened to the stone, right? I mean, who took the stone? I mean, not just anyone can take that stone. It looks pretty heavy. I don't know how many tons it weighs, but surely uh, human beings without some kind of technology would not be able to get that stone from that spot. And so that's a question that remains unanswered. Of course, we believe that Yahuwah, using his angels, probably removed that stone with no problem. And so what did Mary notice? The body was not there. And so she was concerned because she wanted to see the body of her king, Yahushua, because of her love for him. And so when she noticed the stone was removed, the body was gone, what did she do? She ran to speak to the disciples. And so she tells Peter, and also speaks to the other disciple whom Yahuwah loved. Who do you think that is? The Apostle John, the one who wrote this gospel. <laughs> right? He refers to himself as the disciple whom Yahuwah loved. And so here's Simon Peter and John, the apostle. And so they were given this news by Mary. And so what did they do? Peter and John. Let's read three down to four. Peter therefore went out and the other disciple, that would be John, and we're going to the tomb. So they both ran together. And the other disciple, he was referring to himself, outran Peter and came to the tomb first. And so when they heard this news about the stone being removed, and perhaps the body of our King Yahushua stolen and taken somewhere else, what did Peter and John do? They ran. Perhaps we can say they bolted into the tomb. And so they both ran together. And who was the one who got there first? 
the disciple whom Yahusha loved. He made sure he put that in there, that he outran the apostle Peter. Well, it's, it's probably because apostle Peter was his elder. And so he did not have the physical prowess to outrun the apostle John. Nevertheless, both of them get to the tomb. Once they get there, what did they decide to do? Let's read five to seven. And he, uh, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen clothes lying there. Yet he did not go in. For some reason, the apostle John, he only looked from a distance. He did not go in. And in verse six, and Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. And he saw the linen clothes lying there and the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded together in the place by itself. And so when they get to the tomb, the apostle John watches from a distance. He sees the linen cloths lying there, but nobody. Apostle Peter arrives to the tomb. This time, but unlike the apostle John, he goes inside the tomb. It's what, would, what we would expect from Apostle Peter being impulsive, right? He decided to go straight. Apostle John was kind of thinking things through before going inside the tomb. But Peter went straight to the tomb. And went in, when he went into the tomb, what did he find? He saw the linen cloths lying there. And the handkerchief was folded together in the place by itself. That's what he found. What did he not find? The body. It was an empty tomb. And so there are two possibilities. It was stolen, taken by someone, or perhaps Yahuwah resurrected our King Yahusha, which is what Yahusha was telling his disciples for the longest time. And so here's Peter inside the tomb. He sees the linen cloths lying there, the handkerchief folded in a place by itself, which would indicate what? It would indicate that the linen cloth and the handkerchief or the napkin was undisturbed. In other words, whatever happened, the one who was inside wrapped by the linen did not do the unwrapping by himself. Someone else did it. It is as though the body was never wrapped in the first place. And so it was a mysterious sight. And so when the Apostle John was thinking about what happened, what did he eventually conclude? Let's read 28 down to 10. Then the disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in and he saw and believed. For until then, they still hadn't understood the scriptures that said, Yahusha must rise from the dead. Then they went home. And so after the apostle John enters the tomb and he sees what he sees and begins to process in his mind all the things that our King Yahusha told them that was going to happen, beginning there in Caesarea Philippi. And all the other times our King Yahushua foretold through parables, through direct teaching, that he must die, but he will be resurrected. According to scripture, it was only then that he began to really believe in the message of our King Yahushua. You know, this tells us a lot. I mean, these disciples of our King Yahushua, they walked with Yahushua, right? They ate together with our King Yahushua. They heard from him personally. They were his personal disciples. Yet, it wasn't until later on that they fully understood the meaning of scripture when it says Yahushua must rise from the dead. You see, it's easy to believe in something intellectually. And so the disciples believe intellectually. Yes, Yahushua is going to die. Yes, Yahushua is going to rise back to life. However, until it actually happens, one cannot fully internalize it inside one's heart. It's easy to believe intellectually, but it's another thing to believe in our heart. Because when we begin to believe in our heart, even if what we see seems to oppose 
what we declare by faith, we would not be overcome by the sight, by the circumstance. We will hold on and believe to what we have saw. And so it takes a while to grow into that level of faith. The disciples did not develop that kind of faith until later on. And so here comes Apostle Peter, Apostle John. They begin to believe and they go back home to tell the others. Meanwhile, who remained and stayed behind? Let's read 11 down to 13. Mary was standing outside the tomb crying. And as she wept, she stooped and looked in. She saw two white robed angels, one sitting at the head of the other, at the foot of the place where the body of Yahushua had been lying. Dear woman, why are you crying? The angels asked her. Because they have taken away my Lord, she replied. And I don't know where they have put him. So here's Mary. She stays behind. The disciples left. She's still there. What was she doing by the tomb? She's crying. Here's Mary, very close to our king, Yahushua. But she's crying. Why is she crying? Because she still believes, she's still assuming that the body of our king, Yahushua, was taken by someone and put somewhere else. In other words, she's probably thinking the body was stolen. And so she's crying, and all she can think about was Yahushua and his whereabouts. But then something unusual happened, right? He gets a visit from two angels. Two angels sat at the head, the other at the foot of the place where the body of Yahushua had been lying. Who saw the angels? Mary. Not only did she see the angels, what did she say? What did the angels say to her? They say to her, dear woman, why are you? Crying. Perhaps Mary did not fully realize she was talking to angels. Maybe she thought they were people who were attending to the garden tomb. And so she did not realize it fully because she was weeping. Because she really loves our King Yahushua and now her body was gone. And so what happened after that? Let's read 14 and 16. She turned to leave and saw someone Standing there, it was Yahushua, but she didn't recognize him. Dear woman, why are you crying? Yahushua asked her, who are you looking for? She thought he was the gardener. Sir, she said, if you have taken him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will go and get him. Mary, Yahushua said. She turned to him. And cried out, Rabboni, which is Hebrew for teacher. So here's Mary, and she's weeping and crying. And then she turns to leave. And as she does so, somebody is standing there. Who was the one standing right next to her? It was Yahushua himself. But Mary does not recognize Yahushua immediately. Who does she think this person is? She thinks it's the gardener. And so our King Yahushua asks her, who are you looking for? And then he says, she says, sir, if you have taken him away, tell me where you have put him and I will go and get him. And then Yahushua says, Mary. And she turned to him and cried out, Rabboni. It was then that she realized the one who was right next to her was who? Yahushua. The risen Mashiach was right there speaking to her. And you can see the transformation in her emotion. When she first went to the tomb, she was overwhelmed by what? In grief. When Yahushua presents himself to her, resurrected, she was overwhelmed with joy. That's the message of first fruits, that we should be thankful because no matter what suffering we're going through, it's not final. It's going to pass. And if we are true believers, and if we place our faith and hope and trust in our King Yahushua, indeed, he is risen. 
and soon our grief, our sadness, it will become joy, like the joy of Mary. Can you imagine? I don't know if you can imagine what she must have felt. Can you imagine what she did when all of a sudden the one that you were weeping about because he died, all of a sudden appears to you resurrected. And so this was indeed a moment of transition from grief to joy. Yahusha appeared to her resurrected. Was it only to Mary that Yahusha appeared to? Let's read the book of John 20, 19 and 22. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut or the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Yahusha came and stood in the midst and said to them, peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. So Yahusha said to them again, peace to you as the father has sent me. I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. And so after appearing to Mary, with whom else did our King Yahushua appear to? To his other disciples. Later that same day, when the disciples were assembled together, what did our King Yahushua do? He came in and stood in their midst and said, peace be with you, this was the time, according to the book of Luke, when they thought they saw a spirit, they saw a ghost. That's, this is why our King Yahushua had to present proof, demonstrate to them that it was he. And he did so by showing him his hands and his side. And then when they realized, standing before them, before their very eyes, was the risen Mashiach, they rejoiced. And Yahushua says to them, peace to you, as the Father has sent me, I also send you. And what did Yahushua do? He breathed to them the Holy Spirit. And so Yahushua appeared resurrected to Mary. He appeared resurrected to his disciples. And then he says, as the Father has sent me, I also send you. By extension, our King Yahusha is also telling us the same thing. He is also sending us. This is why we who believe in our King Yahusha, who believe in his resurrection, guess what? Because of the power of the Holy Spirit that we have, which we believe we have, because we have placed our faith and trust in Yahusha, we were baptized into his body, and because we believe in our King Yahusha, all of us are sent. We are sent for a purpose. What is that purpose? Why does our King Yahushua say that as the Father has sent me, I also send you? Let's read the book of Luke, the account according to the physician Luke 24, 45. 24, 44 to 45. Then he said, when I was with you before, I told you that everything written about me, the law of Moses and the prophets, and in the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And so our King Yahushua, when he took the time to visit his disciples assembled together, he tells them about the law of Moses, about the law, of the, about the prophets and the Psalms, basically the Tanakh, the Old Testament, right? And he tells them that all of this must be fulfilled. And then what did he do? He opened their minds to understand scripture. Brothers and sisters, we cannot understand scripture unless our king opens our minds to understand scripture. This is why even before we study the book that Yahuwah has caused to be written by means of his spirit, we need to ask for the spirit's help to understand the scriptures. This is why when we study, we need to pray first. And we are truly thankful that we are very eager to know more about what the scriptures tell us about our King Yahushua. We need to keep searching. We need to keep longing for our King Yahushua because only then will our King Yahushua open our minds to understand scripture. And what did they understand about scripture in connection with our King Yahushua? Let's read what it says, 46 to 48. And he said, yes, it was written long ago 
that the Messiah would suffer and die and rise from the dead on the third day. It was also written that this message would be proclaimed in the authority of his name to all the nations beginning in Jerusalem. There is forgiveness of sins for all who repent. You are witnesses of all these things. And so what did our King Yahushua instruct his disciples to do? Those who became witnesses of his resurrection. He said to them what was written long ago in the Tanakh, in the Old Testament. What was written long ago? It was framed in what is called the Moedim. And what did our King Yahushua say concerning the Moedim? He is going to fulfill Moedim. This is why he said Messiah would suffer and die. That's Passover. And rise from the dead on the third day. What is that? Feast of first fruit. He's telling his disciples the Moedim is going to be fulfilled. And it was fulfilled in their hearing. Because right there and then he was resurrected. And he spoke to them about his resurrection. And then he gave them the instruction. What is that? Proclaim. Proclaim the Moedim. Proclaim how Messiah fulfilled the Moedim. Proclaim that Yahushua died and was risen from the dead on the third day. And so this is what we are to do. Today we celebrate the fact that our King Yahushua had risen. Yes, he died and suffered. Yes, he was buried. But he also rose from the grave. And we are thankful to our Almighty Father, Yahuwah. We are thankful to our King Yahushua. But now we have to do our part. We have to go out there. Yahushua says, as the Father has sent me, now I send you. And so we must go out there and tell the people about how Yahushua fulfilled the Moedim. What is the Moedim again? It was fulfilled by Yahushua. Passover, our King Yahushua died. He fulfilled it. Unleavened bread, our King Yahushua was buried. He fulfilled it. First fruits, our King Yahushua appeared to his disciples, resurrected. He fulfilled it. He fulfilled the Moedim. And when you look at how Yahushua fulfilled the first three Moedim, that is the gospel. The death, burial, and resurrection of our King, Yahushua. That is the gospel message that we must proclaim as witnesses for our King, Yahushua, which is what we are. This is why we are called the assembly of Yahushua. We witness on behalf of Yahushua and how Yahuwah's Moedim and plan was fulfilled in him. The love of Yahuwah manifested in Yahushua is what we need to tell other people about, that their sins may be forgiven and receive the promised salvation. Do you know how important this is? How important the gospel message is? Let's read what the Apostle Paul says about it, Corinthians 15, 5 to 8 and 3. Then he appeared to Peter and then to all 12 apostles. Then he appeared to more than 500 of his followers at once, most of whom are still alive, although some have died. Then he appeared to James and afterward to all the apostles. Last of all, he appeared also to me, even though I am like someone whose birth was abnormal. I passed on to you what I received, which is of the greatest importance, that Christ died for our sins as written in scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised to life three days later as written in the scriptures. How important is the gospel message? What is the gospel message again? It is the fulfillment of scripture that Yahushua will die, be buried, and raised to life on the third day. That's the gospel. How important is that message? Apostle Paul says, I pass on to you that which I receive, which is of the greatest importance. You know, the Bible is full of messages. Am I right? Yeah. It has many teachings. It has the teaching concerning the flood, about the temple, about the history of the people of Elohim. From the time they were beginning to emerge as a nation through Abraham to the time when they were enslaved in Egypt 
and all the days of the wilderness wanderings to the time they enter the promised land and erect the temple. There are many things that the Bible has to tell us. But the one that is of greatest importance is what? The gospel. What is the gospel? The gospel is the fulfillment of Moedim. And our king Yahushua died, was buried, and he resurrected. And how important was his resurrection? Bible tells us there were many eyewitnesses to his resurrection. Not just Mary, not just Peter, not just the initial disciples, but many others. There was even a time when he appeared to 500 of his followers all at once. This is why if there are those who doubt the resurrection of Yahushua, how do you explain that so many independent witnesses all affirm what they saw, the risen Messiah? And so we believe Yahushua resurrected. Brethren, how important is it that we believe Yahushua resurrected on the third day? Let's read what it says in the book of Corinthians 15, 14, 17, 20. And if Christ has not been raised, then all our preaching is useless. And your faith is useless. And if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is useless. And you are still guilty of your sins. In that case, all who have died believing in Christ are lost. And if our hope in Christ is only for this life, we are more to be pitied than anyone in the world. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. He is the first of a great harvest of all who have died. Brothers and sisters, you know how important it is to believe in the resurrection of a King Yahushua? Apostle Paul says, if you believe Yahushua is the Son of God, good. If you believe Yahushua died for your sins, good. If you believe Yahushua was buried, good. But if you do not believe that he had risen, then our faith is what? Useless. And Apostle Paul says, our preaching is useless. Brethren, if Yahushua did not, did not rise back to life, what would make him different? From the other prior religious teachers. What makes him unique? Not only is he the son of God. Not only did he preach the word of Elohim. But he resurrected. And so we need to believe in the resurrection of our king. Yahushua. And he indeed was risen back to life. What did you notice? What Apostle Paul also said about his resurrection and why it's so key and so important for our hope. He also said he is the first of a great harvest of all who have died. Does that ring a bell? What does it mean to be a first of a great harvest? He was the first fruit. And so Yahushua. When he was resurrected and given a body that no longer decays, he became the first fruit. Brethren, if there's a first fruit, there's going to be a greater harvest after the first fruit. What does that mean? Let's read the book of Corinthians 15, 20 to 23. But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by men also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But each one in his own order. Christ the first fruits afterward. Those who are Christ. That is coming. What is the significance of Yahushua HaMashiach? Being the first fruit among those who have fallen asleep. Bible says, if Yahushua rose from the dead, it means those who belong to Christ will also rise from the dead. When? At the proper order. First Christ being the first fruit. And then at his 
coming. This is why when we celebrate the Feast of First Fruits, we proclaim by faith, we rehearse by faith the day when our Christ, our Mashiach, will return. Because when he comes, we will be resurrected and we will be like him. As a matter of fact, what would happen to our body? Once our King Yahushua appears and we become resurrected. Let's read Corinthians 15, 42 to 44. It is the same way with the resurrection of the dead. Our earthly bodies are planted in the ground when we die. They shall be raised to live forever. Our bodies are buried in brokenness, but they'll be raised in glory. They are buried in weakness, but they'll be raised in strength. They are buried as natural human bodies, but they shall be raised as spiritual bodies. For just as there are natural bodies, there are also spiritual bodies. And so what will happen to us when our King Yahushua appears? The Bible says, even if we die, we're going to be resurrected. And Apostle Paul was giving us an analogy about resurrection. What is that analogy all about? He likened our body to a seed, but when it dies and planted into the ground, it will produce a harvest, will become a plant. And our Apostle Paul says, as human beings, when we die and when we resurrect, our bodies are going to be different. What goes into the ground is a body that is broken, that is weak. But when it resurrects, it will be a body in glory, a spiritual body. This is what we look forward to. This is why Apostle Paul, if you notice in what he said earlier, if our hope in Yahushua is only for this life on earth, we are the most pitiable person of all. Why did he say that? Because our King Yahushua died, was buried, and was resurrected. Not so that. Our life here on earth will be perfect. No. So that we will be resurrected with a perfect body. A spiritual and glorious body. Like the body of our King Yahushua himself. But in this life right now. In what we live with our present body. It's going to decay. It is easily broken. And it is weak. And so our bodies now is not meant. To live there in heaven. It's going to go through a change. This is why Yahushua's resurrection means so much to us. Because in the same way our King Yahushua was resurrected. We too. We too. Will be resurrected. And what will become of our bodies when that happens. Let's read Corinthians 15, 51 and 53. But let me reveal to you a wonderful secret. We will not all die. But we will all be transformed. It will happen in a moment, in the blinking of an eye. When the last trumpet is blown, for when the trumpet sounds, those who have died will be raised to live forever. And we who are living will also be transformed. For our dying bodies must be transformed into bodies that will never die. Our mortal bodies will be, must be transformed into immortal bodies. And so at the sound of the trumpet, which signals the return of our King Yahushua is going to bring his assembly. We change or transform bodies. Our bodies that are dying will become immortal bodies that will never die. Brethren, we are not yet there. We have not yet received that glorious body. The body we have now is the same body that every human being has. A body that's weak, gets sick, experiences suffering and sadness. This is why, if you notice all the apostles, because they were still in their bodies, they suffered much. They were afraid. They were not perfect. Mary even doubted. He did not fully believe. He still questioned, is this really Yahushua? The apostles, they also could not fully believe. They were still in their bodies. But one day, our bodies will be changed. But while we still have this body, there's always that temptation 
to lose hope. Brethren, it's the life we now live is not easy. And that, that I think is one of the message of the gospel. It's not supposed to be easy. What we're going through now day by day, the daily grind, we wake up, we work, we go through the challenges of daily life. Sometimes we have to settle a problem with our family, with our children, and then we get bad news about sickness, people getting laid off. When bad things happen to us, we begin to forget about the miracle of the resurrection. And so we become sad, and we begin to suffer, we begin to grieve, we begin to cry, we begin to weep. This is why it's so fantastic from time to time, brethren, to kind of pause and to think about what already happened. Brethren, whenever we feel overwhelmed by sorrow, whenever we feel overcome by sadness in life, what should we always strive to remember? Next slide. Always remember the empty two, our king. Yes, he suffered. We too must suffer. Yes, he died. We too must die. But he also resurrected. Because we believe he has risen. We too will be risen. That is our hope. No matter how bad things get. No matter how hopeless things may seem to be. Remember, he has risen. And because of that, no bad news is ever permanent. No sadness is ever permanent. No loneliness is ever permanent. No grief is ever permanent. Why? Because he has risen and he will break through the sadness and sufferings of life and he will bring in the light of his glory. This is what we celebrate. He has risen. And so before we pray as a congregation, we're almost done. But our King Yahushua wants to ask us a question. What is that question that he wants to ask us? Allow me to read the book of John 11, 25 to 26. Yahushua said to her, this was Martha. Remember what happened to Lazarus? Yahushua was a dear friend of Martha and Lazarus. And when he became permanently ill, he asked for Yahushua. But purposely, Yahusha came late so that Lazarus would actually die. And so when Yahusha arrived and Martha says he's dead, here too late. Martha was weeping, and rightly so. As human beings, we weep. Even Yahusha wept. We cannot remove the tears in this life. We're going to go through difficult times. But when Yahusha spoke to her, Yahushua said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. And then he asks her the question that he wants to ask us when we go through times of grief and sadness. What is that question? Do you believe this? Brothers and sisters, if our King Yahushua Asked us this question now. I am the resurrection and the life. Do you believe him? Do you believe he is the resurrection and the life? It's easy to say we believe. You can have an intellectual belief. But what we need to do is to bring that belief that we proclaim. That Yahushua died, yes, but he resurrected. We need to bring that belief into our hearts. So that... Whatever we see, the circumstances of our life will no longer affect our belief. We will hold on to it no matter what. That's what it means to begin to live by faith, not by sight. It's not that easy. Even the disciples had to struggle through it. What more we who never met personally our King Yahushua, we have to grow into it. We need to live out our faith. And so how can we live out our faith? So that we can keep believing, not just in our minds, but in our hearts. Indeed, Yahushua has risen, that he is the resurrection and the life. Let me read the book of John, chapter 10, 
27 to 29. But the one who enters through the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him and the sheep recognize his voice and come to him. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish. No one can snatch them away from me for my father has given them to me and he is more powerful than anyone else. No one can snatch them from the father's hand. Brothers and sisters, what we need to do is to make sure what we believe in our minds is what we believe in our hearts. How can we make this kind of growth, this kind of maturity, when we keep listening to the voice of our shepherd? Why should we listen to the voice of our shepherd? Because he loves us and wants to guide us and wants to lead us. What does the shepherd, our King Yahushua, say about the sheep? He says, no one can snatch them out of my hands. No one can snatch them from the Father's hands. What they will receive is eternal life. Do you know why we're assured of everlasting life? Did you notice what our great shepherd said about his sheep? Yahushua says, he calls his own sheep by name. He knows our name. He knows who we are. He knows us personally and intimately. The more we know him, the more he gets to know us. The more confident we become. The stronger our faith becomes. So much so that even when the circumstances of our life turn against us, we will prevail because of his voice. It is the voice of Mashiach that will give us hope and comfort. It is the voice of Mashiach calling out our name that will give us the courage that will transform grief into joy. Do you still remember Mary? When she went to the tomb, she was overtaken by grief. But what was it that happened to her which caused her to turn her grief into joy? Let's read the final passage of our studies today. We read this a while ago. She turned to leave and saw someone standing there. It was Yahushua, but she didn't recognize him. I'm gonna pause her for a while. Mary did not realize Yahushua was there all along because she was so overwhelmed by grief. Brethren, sometimes when we too feel overwhelmed, we don't even realize the one standing next to us is Yahushua. She thought she was alone, but she's not. Yahushua was right there. And Yahushua says, dear woman, why are you crying? Yahushua asked her, who are you looking for? She thought he was the gardener. Sir, she said, if you have taken him away, Tell me where you have put him, and I will go and get him. Mary, Yahushua said. She turned to him and cried out, Rabboni, which is Hebrew for teacher. Brethren, Mary thought she was by herself. Mary thought she had lost Yahushua, but she was right there all along. Do you know? What gave Mary the courage and the joy? What gave her comfort? Do you know what convinced her that the one who was standing right next to her was in fact the risen Mashiach? Do you know what it was? Next slide. Yahushua said, Mary. That's it. There was something about his voice. And when he called out her name, right there and then, he knew that was no gardener. That was the king of kings 
right beside her. And at that instant, her grief turned into joy. Brethren, one day, even if we are in the grave, someone will call out our name. And that someone who will call out our name will be so precious. And when he speaks our name, it will be so precious in our ears. Even if we are at the grave, we're going to stand up. All our grief, all our sadness. When we see Yahushua, when we arise from the grave, we shall also receive that joy. That is unspeakable, brethren. Remember, he is risen. There's nothing on earth that can ever erase that. He is risen. And because he is risen, we too will arise. And we will rise above the sorrows, the sadness, even the death that plagues all of society. Graces be to our Father. Graces be to our King. Let us stand and we shall pray together. Everlasting Father, thank you so much. Forgive us if sometimes we are overwhelmed by sadness and grief. We do not mean to express any doubt. It is just that we are human. And when we are overwhelmed by sadness that sometimes comes one after another, you cannot help but weep and cry. We know this about us. We are easily discouraged by bad news. The circumstances of life can be so overwhelming and we no longer are able to live by faith and only by sight. Yahuwah, forgive us. We thank you for this, Moridim. As we observe the Feast of First Fruits today, it reminds us that we must never lose hope, even in death which was supposed to be final. It's not final. It is but the beginning. When people weep at the gravesite, we know it is just a transition because soon you will send your son and we will be risen just as he was risen. We proclaim this by faith. We believe in you, Father. It is because of your love that you have given us this path. The path we are on may be filled with sorrow and sadness, but the end is glory. The end is resurrection. The end is joy. We will be with you forevermore. Thank you, Abba. We praise you always for all that you have done and will continue to do. Our King Yahushua, how we long to see you. We know you know us by name. Speak to us. We want to hear your voice. We celebrate this day to commemorate your resurrection. How we long to see you face to face. To feel your embrace. Oh King. You are alive. You are at the right hand of Abba. Make us filled with courage. Help us to overcome sadness. Please. When we feel overwhelmed. When we are weak. When we feel sadness. Do not permit that we lose our faith. Use an instrument. Stand by our side. Call out our name. You know us. You know our weaknesses. Oh, King Yahushua, please bless us with strength. Bless us with your Holy Spirit that we can go on until the end. Oh, Father, how we long for that day when you will send your son on that day, loving Abba, 
we beseech you, remember our loved ones, remember our children, remember our parents. May no one be left behind when the trumpet sounds and you call out your name and the name of those who belong to you. Bring us one by one unto yourself to be with you forever, Lord. Father, thank you so much for listening to our prayers. May you continue to heal your people, continue to work in our life, that we'll become mature in our faith, become strong in our hope. Amen. We ask and beg everything, Abba, in the name of our Lord and Savior, Yahushua HaMashiach. Amen. Let us praise our Father Yahweh and His Son Lord Yahusha through the sacred Holy Spirit. Is there. Let's proclaim God's glorious name. Amen. May Yahuwah Abba son failing love and tender mercies overshadow us. The memory and peace of Yahusha HaMashiach strengthen us, and the constant companionship of the Ruach Kadash be with all of us now and forevermore. Amen. Uh, brothers and sisters, I just a few announcements. Let's not forget that our uh, spring Passover festival is not yet complete. We still have the last day of Unleavened Bread, which will be Tuesday, April 11 at 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. This will be in lieu of the BQA. Uh, so this coming Tuesday, instead of having the BQA, we're going to have a special worship service, the last day of Unleavened Bread. And however, next Thursday, or this coming Thursday, we do have the uh, BHP. And of course, this coming uh, next week, next weekend, we will be back to regular worship service schedules. Let's not forget, uh, also next Saturday, we'll have our discipleship training program at 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Uh, group leaders, do not forget to prepare your groups to present uh, the research that you have been doing um, so that we can discuss them together when we have our discipleship training program. Also, uh, on April 21st and April 22, we will resume with our children's ministry. Uh, the dates and times are posted right there. And lastly, uh, we're going to begin um, our Sacred Names Philippines, which will be in Tagalog. And so Sacred Names Philippines Part 1 will commence on April 22nd, which will be Saturday, California time at 10 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, which means in the Philippines is going to be Sunday, April 23 at 1 p.m. So it will be Tagalog, 1 p.m. Manila time, Sunday in the Philippines. That is all. May Yahuwah Abba and Yahusha HaMashiach bless all of us.